so welcome back. Uh, so this is our last talk for today, but first we have a small raffle. Um, who would like to win an iPhone? Okay, so if somebody is missing a black iPhone, we found one <laughs> front desk. If two people show up, we will have to see. Okay, so uh, the next talk will be about IOMMU. Piotr, this is your stage. Thank you. Enjoy. Okay, so I'm the last person between you and beer, and hopefully I will not bore you to death. Uh, the number is just coincidence, so... Um, yeah, so... Um, I'm not expert in memory management um, on, on in firmware, so uh, this is like mostly my spare time work uh, when I try to reveal uh, patches which were very long abandoned, and I needed some this patches to enable some additional security features and would like to talk you a little bit about that. So we will talk about introduction, motivation, um, what we need for, for enabling uh, AMD IOMMU, uh, which is mostly ACPI, but I will not bore you with, this, with details of the structures, but just high level. Um, and what's, what's the implementation state and what we want to do with that. So, so who am I? I'm, I'm the founder and embedded system consultant in 3MDEP, uh, embedded system consulting company based in Poland. Um, we have a small team, like at 20 people. Um, we are ma mainly doing PC engines maintainership. We are very interested about security uh, and updatability of the platforms. We are interested in learning about advanced hardware features, like virtualization I consider advanced, uh, because not many uh, so-called IBVs do, do this correctly. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's why I'm here. My motivation for this talk was um, fascination about what happened on the uh, um, Xen, Xen hypervisor and various operating systems that grow around that ecosystem, which is Cubes OS, OpenXT, and recently announced uh, Vivia OS, uh, which are targeted for uh, personal computing. Um, so X, X, OpenXT is critical infrastructure, probably used by military guys, uh, automotive, uh, is Viria OS target. And then also I saw some customer requests uh, on forum, of, on PCNG's forum, where, where they asked, um, they want to build virtualized firewalls to redirect like one Ethernet port to this virtual machine and then internally redirect traffic between other virtual machines. Um, so that, that gives uh, isolation for, for, for example, some web application which may be not secure, so if someone breaks into web application, uh, will have hard time to get through VM and access other VMs uh, to pound the machine. Also, NICs can be separated for different purposes because we have dedicated um, firewall systems like PFSense, we can just dedicate NIC for, for PFSense and that's a that's great thing about that. Proxmox can use those features. CoreOS is kind of system that may use virtualization and as well like uh, uh, hypervisor type 2, which is KVM, for example, it can utilize features exposed by, uh, by ACPA tables, uh, which define how to use IOMMU. So I would like to introduce you to some simple terminology. Um, we have to know what's AM, uh, MMU, what's DMA, what's virtualization, and finally how it puts together into IOMMU. So MMU, we just, this is just used for translating virtual addresses to physical addresses. Typically we have, uh, so it's, it's uh, mainly manage virtual memory. Um, so it checks if, um, if we have access, correct access to this memory, and if not, then, then raise correct exceptions. It also control cache behavior and do the bus arbitration uh, if multiple accesses issued. It also has something called TLB, which caused recently quite a lot of problems. Um, so it keeps uh, the transla translation in the special cache, so this translation will be very fast. So that's in general, so DMA is, is something that we use to offload 
um, work from our CPU. So we program our DMA controller with some address, with some amount of data, and with some operation, which can be read or write. And then uh, we can say, uh, we want to transfer this data from this place to this, uh, this memory um, without interaction of CPU, or write or read. Yeah? So yeah, the steps are like, first we program the MA controller, then we do the request to the IO controller of a device, then we're getting uh, the transfer, and finally uh, we finish the transfers, there is ac accepting, and then we get interrupt to the CPU that everything finished and, and you can do something with this data that you uh, wanted to read or write. Okay, so virtualization, we typically uh, think about two types of virtualization. We have a type one, which is, which is Zen, for example, and this means that we have kind of kernel, which is typically bare metal kernel, and, and uh, the, after starting this kernel, we have uh, like a, a virtual machine um, which manages uh, creating other guests. In case of Zen, it's called DOM0, and guests call it DOM U. Um, and in case of uh, type 2 hypervisor, um, we just have a module in our operating, operating system which help us create uh, guest, guest OSs of virtual machines. And of course, in, in type 2 situation, uh, we, have, we can have other host processes that work with this kernel. And yeah, and IOMMU can, be, can, be, uh, can help those um, hypervisors. There is something called IOTLB, uh, which is just TLB for IO devices. So uh, this picture shows uh, more or less how the uh, TLB works. So um, you can see that if CPU wants some, um, some memory, which, is, which in here is called logical address, uh, it can face two situations. Either it hits this address in TLB cache, uh, which is fine because this is performance improvement, or, or they will miss uh, this translation to physical memory, and then things kind of complicate because uh, then we have to do page walk and find this memory if it really exists, and, and maintain that stuff. This is typically uh, with co in cooperation with operating system. So, so TLB is mostly for um, normal memory access, and IOTLB is for devices. So finally, IOMMU. So IOMMU is just is MMU, but for IO devices. And what it gives us is it can give us uh, hardware enforced memory protection. So that means that we can enforce that given device have access to given memory and, and not more. Um, we can do virtual address translation for DMA. So in case of uh, virtual machines, our guests are um, communicating, with, communicating with the outside world with help of hypervisor. And we, if this uh, guest wants to do uh, some DMA operation with the device, hypervisor is is always involved. And that's bad because this is performance drop. So if we have a uh, virtual address translation uh, and we can program IOMMU to help in that, then hypervisor is offloaded and thus can do that with high performance. Similar stuff with, is with page table sharing. Page table sharing is a, um, is a technique which gives, for example, graphics per performance. That means that we have some page tables, so we have some virtual uh, address translation to physical address translation, and we just want to use the same virtual addresses for uh, our processes and, let's say, graphic card. Yeah, and in that's why, if if we in both cases we can use the same virtual addresses, this simplify programming. And finally, we have PCI pass through, which is which was most interesting for me uh, so far, which is kind of um, ability to. Uh, um, configure hardware in a way that um, one VM has complete control over this hardware. So it's even not visible from uh, operating system then, if we, if we configure that correctly. So what kind of problems uh, IOMMU uh, can solve? So one of the problems is DMA attack. So DMA attack happen in, uh, at the point where CPU, when uh, CPU 
so first of all, how DMA starts. So CPU um, can um, can issue some virtual address, then MMU um, checks protection, and if 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 this process is allowed to access memory, then it gets access to the memory and can read or write. Uh, but then we want to do some uh, DMA, uh, like some DMA action, like read or write. So we configure the device to do this DMA, uh, DMA action. There is normal flow that, that I described previously about the ACK and requests. But then this device, if the device is kind of malicious or we have buggy driver or we have some other problems, it may happen that it access some arbitrary memory. And this is a very bad situation because this arbitrary memory can contain, for example, our private key or some, some data that we want, don't want to reveal. And because there is no um, MMU for device, then it's just uh, no, no one can enforce that. For CPU, MMU takes care of, of enforcing uh, the protection checks and con correct translation. So because of that, we need IOMMU. So M IOMMU, when cor correctly configured, will not allow device to access memory that, is not, mm, that it should not. So yeah, as I said, it can be done by malicious device or buggy device drivers. Mm, okay. So there are other features of, uh, of IOMMU which can be helpful, for example, um, interrupt remapping um, and interrupt virtualization. So in this case, the situation is like, let's say we have guests that, that running on core zero, and of course guests can transition between many cores, like uh, in, in multi-core system it happens a lot. And then if um, device issue uh, interrupt, it goes through hypervisor, and then there is a need to figure out on which core guest is to, to deliver the interrupt. That cause something called inner processor interrupts. So a processor just interrupt to, to, to interrupt correct between themselves. Let's say core zero get the interrupt, but the VM is not there, so it looks for the VM where, where, on which core it is and delivers that interrupt to the, to the machine. So. Thanks to the IOMMU, we have something like a uh, guest virtual AP uh, table, which can help in redirecting uh, interrupt at just after arriving to correct, uh, correct place. So this is performance improvement. So I already told you about that. So um, virtual address translation, this is like kind of to not have overhead uh, with the hypervisor handling DMA accesses from VM to the, to the memory. Page, page table sharing is a virtual address for graphics and for normal process, and the PCI pass-through, you already know about that. So this is typical uh, design of the AMD. It can have more than one IOMMU, and you can see that uh, IOTLB is in the device, and this is kind of like just to visualize in your head how things look like, where is the IOMMU, how it relates to the memory controller. So yeah, so that's, that's the thing. So if the, if the um, IO wants to access, uh, IO device wants to access DRAM, it has to get uh, through IOMMU, of course, if it's ena enabled. So problem with um, IOMMU is that, that those components are very complex. Like the specs are like over 200 pages. It refers many other specs, and things getting uh, complicated very fast. And doing that co that correctly is is hard. And uh, you can see in in the net that many people complain that uh, graphics pass through doesn't work for me, and so on and so on. They want to play, for example, some games on Linux. Uh, and try to do PCI pass-through for the graphics card, and they cannot do that because uh, ACPI tables are broken. And because uh, this is because there are so many features that even the manufacturers do not know how to program that. And this, of course, happen and propagate on uh, IBVs, so independent BIOS vendors. And uh, that's the example because. There are some basic features which are supported always, which are simple, like device virtual, uh, device virtual address to physical address translation, interrupt remapping, 
access permission checking. These are simple stuff. And then we have like a bunch of like a 64-bit register which enables various things which com probably um, not work with all combinations. Yeah. So there are pr probably plenty of uh, combinations that doesn't work. But there are some interesting features here. And I would like to tell you a little bit about that. Of course, we don't have time for, and this would be really boring to get through all those features. But the most important ones, uh, so AMD claims that there are 28 software visible features uh, in this IOMMU implementation. And yeah, so it's hard to identify those and even confirm that they work, uh, but, but who cares? Uh, so a very interesting feature, in my opinion, is SMI filter. So it can uh, intercept unexpected SMIs. It can, it, it can block some, um, some suspicious SMIs, which is good for, for security. Although I don't know how it exactly works yet because didn't dive deep, in, deep enough in that. There are classic stuff like uh, NX bit in page tables and uh, access protection. And there is an uh, interesting feature which is called MARC, Memory Address Routing and Control, which just can through the um, IOMMU control uh, to just improve the performance. But because, of course, um, IOMMU like, cause drop in performance when, when configured. Okay, so yeah, if we disable IOMMU, we just simply pass the traffic, but when we enable, we have like a kind of three things that every time we have to do. So we have to check permissions for any, any request uh, from device to memory. And we have to translate addresses. Uh, we have to um, send those translated addresses to the, to the system. And to achieve that goals, uh, IOMMU used three tables, which is permission checks table, address translation table, with, and uh, interrupter mapping table. And those tables are cached. And the problem with those is that user is responsible for invalidating those caches. So, and of course, this is uh, this is no problem um, where we facing cache issues on our platforms. And uh, the nice thing about this IOMMU is that you can log plenty of events, and you can try to analyze that and debug that. Of course, this is kind of complex stuff and. Uh, probably requires some uh, manpower to uh, do correctly. But uh, for example, very very demanding feature for PC engines, ECC, and and you can lock ECC events on on low level um, IO, IOMMU registers. Okay, so what's important from the implement firmware developer perspective, from the implementation perspective? Of course, there is no way one system can utilize all features. Um, it is recommended that um, this initialization will be performed by firmware before facing any operating system or hypervisor. So, so that's important that we have to do that early. Then um, the only way to describe this to the, like there are two ways of describing that to the system, but most use it is ACP11. Uh, there, there is device tree uh, approach, but the problem with device tree is nobody using that. And that's, that's but like nobody using a device tree for configuring IOMMU. Everyone expo expose ACPI, and there are only ACPI drivers for uh, configuring IOMMU. And yeah, and firmware must preserve or restore uh, configuration between um, various power state transitions. Yeah, so also I talked with Ulf Risk, Ulf Risk uh, about DMA attacks. And he said like, uh, th that the configuration of IOMMU have to happen really, really early, even before PCI enumeration, because, uh, because simply default parameters w which you start with are, are incorrect and, and cause damage. If, of course, someone will be able to deploy malicious device to your system, for example, because this is m most concern ob ob about this case. Mm, OK. This is like uh, first first version of the slide had kind of um, screens from the spec that's showing the tables, but I just decided that this is completely uh, useless and you probably will you know go sleep when you look at that. So I just try to visualize that. 
Um, you can see here we have uh, the main ACPI structure that we operate on is called IO virtualization reporting structure is on, on the left side and it contains it can have two versions um, th there is ACPI version for the dynamic devices and there is um, for uh, other version the version one for fixed devices there is uh, IV info structure I, I, I don't want to get through to all the details I even don't know uh, all possible bits here, but but uh, just show you the structure. And the most important thing is IO virtualization block, which can contain two types of blocks. It's uh, IO virtualization hardware definition and uh, IO virtualization memor memory definition. And memory definitions are, are the one that very interested interesting for us from the protection perspective, because there we define um, who can what, who can do what. So what device have, have what range of accesses, what types of accesses, if this is read, write, and so on. And then we have um, uh, IO virtualization hardware definition. This, um, this table defines a um, um, set of devices that we have on our platform, which then can be redirected to uh, our virtual machines to be directly used inside the, inside the guest. And that's that's mainly it about the ACPI. So what what's the story about the implementation? So initial implementation was made by two people, Kiosti and Timothy, uh, well known in Corbut community. Um, so Kiosti implementation, like in uh, 2016, relied mostly on Agesa. Agesa is kind of FSP for AMD. So um, he just re relied on values returned uh, by Agesa, and I will show you that this was not exactly correct because I guess I just has a broken uh, version of this table, just don't care about correctly setting it up. Um, and then, then there was kind of binary patching of this IVRS structure, which was also kind of not helping much for community. And the, the, for KVM, we have something called uh, isolation domain, and this means uh, in, in practice, all devices should have isolation, its own isolation domain to be able to be assigned to virtual machine. And the problem was that all devices were just in one isolation domain. So you either assign to VM all devices or not. So that was also the problem. And it was not stable across three boots. So Timothy implementation fixed it, like most of that. But the problem was like a code was kind of convoluted, very nested. Um, quite, a, quite a lot of hard-coded values which I cannot decode un until now because like I'm looking at it and there is like even eight bits it, each bean, bit means something different and I just wonder if I will break something if I change this bit or not because it's not clear from the specification uh, what it really does but you know it's it's I believe it's coming with the experience and only the um, hardware definition uh, type 10 was used, which means that it has some limitation, but I will not go down with that if you want to, you can read the spec. Um, yeah, so, but kudos to those guys because this started the work and and 3 mdep like uh, in June started to continue that. We had this on to-do list for a long time, but they just didn't have time. And I recently tried to prepare that for, for, for motivate myself and prepare, prepare that for that conference. And finally, I was able to do the test under Zen 4.8 and uh, Debian with the long-term stable kernel. And yeah, so I'm still fi fixing bugs there, um, but, but something's working. So maybe a little bit about the implementation. It's very little, like this nine, fi nine file changes, 300 lines of code after simplification, because before simplification, it was much more bloated. Um, and, and we have simple things uh, here. So this is core boot paths, yeah? core boot project paths. Um, I just assume that everyone in knows core boot, but maybe not, this is not the case. So we just added some PCI IDs to I make IOMMO det detectable. Uh, in device tree, core boot device tree, we enabled for PCNG's platform all the possible platforms, two, three, four, five. Uh, we enabled uh, IOMMU. Then we um, have to modify um, make file to add the IOMMU driver. There is a simple IOMMU driver, which is 
not a big deal uh, in this situation, but the, the most important thing is in uh, North Bridge C, uh, which is, uh, which is a definition of IVRS ACPI table. Um, and, and of course, uh, we need to modify initialization of the AGESA uh, to make uh, IOMU um, use correct information and be enabled. Yeah, so, so how it is called? During boot, we, uh, if someone familiar with the core boot boot state machine, uh, during boot we have a state which is called um, BUS write tables. And at this point we have a kind of um, uh, call stack which we go through um, write tables, arch write tables, write ACPI table, and then finally we get to write ACPI tables for a given device, and we just have implementation for our device, which is, which is our MM, IOMMU, and then we can do some patching with the tables. So what we right now do, oh yeah, this is something what I want to show you. On the left side, there is a uh, AGESA uh, ACPI table, and you can see that it's much different for, from what I, what I created. Uh, I can say that uh, maybe with the pointer. Yeah, so you can see that um, this is this is our device structure. Uh, each eight bytes is one device, so we have like uh, um, six devices just. Th this is not 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 sh six entries, which is the the platform is much bigger. It has uh, uh, Ethernet ports. It it has MPCA ports. So it's much bigger than just those six devices. So obviously AMD didn't care uh, enough about um, enabling that for various devices. And I understand that because uh, this chip is used in various designs and they cannot predict all the possible designs. Yeah, uh, but, but yeah, uh, that didn't work. That caused hangs if we enabled um, ACPI tables which were delivered by the vendor this just didn't work, just caused some additional problems. And we, it took time to figure out uh, what is going on and why it's, why it's happened, because those hangs were kind of looking random. Yeah, but finally we have things fixed it to the extent that, um, that we can test something. And the question was, so this process took time and there was not easy answer, okay, how I will test that? Uh, because then you are a firmware developer and next day you have to test uh, PCA pass-through from the hypervisor. And, and I learned about the Zen. Um, and what we did, we just created kind of a development environment with Zen. So we're booting Zen over Pixie. Uh, we're just creating uh, PCA pass-through. Like this is... Uh, uh, <coughs> bus 2 is, uh, um, is our... Um, Ethernet, uh, Ethernet uh, card, like a meter port on APU2. I don't know if you're familiar with that, with that platform. And we're just passing it, uh, uh, we're just assigning it to be able to pass it through to the VM. Then we have to create correct, uh, correctly VM and it will be assigned directly to the guest. And this is, this is the proof. This is, um, this is LS, LSPCI from uh, inside the guest machine. And it's showing um, our uh, NIC controller, um, our NIC uh, directly in the machine, and you can see it's different. Um, it's different, uh, di different device in, in LSPCI in, in terms of topology, uh, because this is this is not the host but the guest machine. And when we have that, we want to. What's important about that? We want to check if it's perform as it should. So we should have almost no penalty on uh, between hardware test of uh, performance and PCI pass-through. So, and this is, this is definition of, uh, of the Debian CFG that I used for creating uh, virtual machine. So you can see here that there is a device that I pass through. Yeah? And you need, of course, uh, hardware virtualized um, guest. Yeah, so these are information about the system that I tested. I also tested PFSense. Um, 
I used iPerf to um, to do the performance testing, and you can read more about that um, on our blog. This is a uh, result that I that I get. So um, so this is server side. This is this is inside VM, and you can see that this is gigabit uh, gigabit Ethernet. So and you can see that I have like almost maximum, and unfortunately I don't have screen for virtualized guest with, without hardware support, but the numbers are like 600 megabits per second. So it's like a 50% increase in comparison to um, in comparison to um, para virtualized, and it's almost maximum possible by hardware. So that's that's very good. Um, so then I wanted to prepare for that talk uh, DMI attack presentation uh, and show you that uh, I can configure IOMMU to protect myself against, the, against DMA attacks. But the problem, was, problem with that is it's quite complex to perform and you need additional hardware and additional expertise. So um, I talked with Ulf. Uh, he, he luckily also have uh, APU2 platform and he checked some stuff and he said like the best would be if you buy PCIe Screamer and we already have that waiting in our office for maybe next talk uh, in in next next conference and uh, other things that were made in the area of dmi um, checking was uh, that google uh, did fuzzing on of intel vtd and and they found some things in dmr because okay let's tell a little bit about the intel vtd so for amd we have ivrs acpa table and for VTD, we have DMAR, D-M-A-R, uh, ACPA table, which is which doing exactly the, the same thing, but they, of course, have to invent different specification to make our life uh, more complex. And um, so, um, yeah, so Intel did the fuzzing, uh, get some results, go to vendors, they fix it, ACPA stuff, but they didn't reveal the fuzzing framework and they didn't reveal much about the problems they found. They just wrote that there, there was something. Okay, so what's the current state? So we tested PCI pass-through for Debian and PFSense, and it, it works, um, at least based on performance numbers. Um, and there were no longevity tests, so I cannot say you can take it to the production and use it. Uh, so that's, that's something to, to do. Um, we still have some, some small problems with, uh, with hangs. It, it n do not happen often. Um, and I'm not sure if this is more a Zen problem or kind of something with in my firmware. Um, yeah, still still wondering about that. The problem is to realize that I have to enter um, Zen development area, which is kind of additional learning curve for me. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe in the future I will provide something uh, about that. Um, so. Yeah, so and these random hangs, if someone want to go to the production, it's like you should not do that before testing and, and making sure it works for you. Yeah, so these are references that I use, so specification of IOMMU and, uh, and uh, AMD architecture. Okay, so uh, yeah, so what we learned from that. First of all, um, vendors, like uh, the, the supply chain is a way, in a way that um, Silicon vendor provides some reference implementation. Then this reference implementation goes to the IBVs, uh, which are no more or less about the implementation. And they ship something, sometimes something modified to us, sometimes completely something not modified and not adjusted for our needs. And, and binary blobs, uh, this is kind of binary blob that, that we're getting. And we can do nothing about that. And, and we don't like that. And we will fight with that as a core boot community, and I believe. Uh, this is something that that we want to fix, uh, and the problem for for firmware consulting companies is it's time consuming to find the problems and fix the problems. And sometimes you can't do that because you just cannot work around the problem. So what, what kind of future work we can we can do with that? Uh, for sure, we need stabilization. We need merge in mainline. Those patches hanging quite a lot of, a lot of time in in mainline. There are not many reviewers, so if you want to contribute feel free uh, to do that. Uh, so we need to move these patches further. Um, 
there are many advanced features, like you saw this register 64-bit uh, register with advanced features. Uh, we have to think about if there is any value for that and maybe enable that. And maybe, I don't know, maybe GPU pass-through. I don't, I don't know if it's even possible, um, but it would be interesting. Uh, I, I wonder also if the same stuff is broken on uh, Epic and Reason. And it's, I don't know, someone have to check that because it's possible and this knowledge can be reused for, for new AMD processors. And of course, we have to prove that uh, IOM protects against DMA attacks. And of course, if this will work, the next step is probably OpenXT or Viria OS or something like that. Uh, and to quote Joanna Rutkowska, we should go toward reasonable, secure, I don't know, routers. Okay, that's all from me. And thank you very much for, you know, being here for so long. <laughs> now we can drink beer. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Don't know whether I uh, got it right. Um, uh, did you say that uh, the firmware would be the, the more or less trusted environment and the uh, hypervisors or the, the Xen uh, does not need to be trusted anymore? No, 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 that's... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I would say uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, but if you look at the projects which are made by kind of serious players in military, in Air, air Force, in, um, in automotive, uh, they're going into that direction S and obviously they're using like hypervisors uh, in embedded environment where you have kind of um, fixed set of virtual machines Let's say your UI in your car got one virtual machine, but other virtual machine handling Artos, which handles your, you know, engine or brakes. So, and this all on Zen hypervisor. So I assume they know much better than me about the security and, and uh, reliability of this solution. Of course, you are welcome to break it, uh, but uh, if you look at the history of Zen and how many times people were able to break through, uh, it's not so often, and it's quite a secure system, and that's why probably Joanna Rutukowska from CubeOS also working with Zen and trying to uh, build on that. So, I don't know. Okay, so uh, a second related question. Um, so, so the firmware is, is configuring the I.O. MU? Yes. Or is it uh, done by, by both instances? Maybe Xen is doing it and uh, so the firmware is doing it in, in front of, of Xen. So first of all, uh, like firmware is responsible, as I, as I mentioned on, on one slide, firmware is responsible uh, about exposing ACPI tables which say about the hardware configuration of the system. And IOMMU, um, initialization have, have to be made by firmware because if we starting with hypervisor, hypervisor cannot handle that. But uh, then using those features uh, requires uh, capability of the hypervisor and capability of the, uh, if type two use it, capability of the system. Okay, so, so uh, the firmware is doing the basic initialization and uh, Xen is uh, just using it then into the productive uh, yes, setting. Yes, but okay. if we, for example, care about the DMA attack that may happen in between, uh, well, I like, like while, while booting, that's why, uh, what, why uh, experts saying that you should do correct initialization as soon as possible, which probably is possible in maybe even in ROM stage, which is like, I don't know, like uh, 100 milliseconds or less. So yeah, so uh, hopefully not enough time for performing anything. And if it, then if nothing is enabled, then um, there is no place to, to do the attack. So if, device, I, if PCI devices does not work, then there is no place to put the attack, yeah, there. Of course. So, yeah, so, so we have to minimize the space where we, where we can perform attack. And the problem right now is there are two problems. We want to uh, improve performance for Zen guests for this kind of platforms. Uh, and IOMU have to work because it didn't work previously and have to have enabled advanced features because Zen using that and ha has correct support for that. And second thing is we want to 
uh, if we have this virtualization, then we have to want to use these advanced virtualized operating systems like Viria OS or uh, OpenXT. Cubes OS in this case doesn't make sense because it's, it doesn't have uh, VGA output or any uh, graphics. This is router system. So, but, uh, but if something is based on AMD and use similar driver, then yeah, that, that also Cubes OS. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you try to initialize the uh, IOMMU without AGESA? Uh, without? Without the vendor code, AGESA, AGESA? Uh, it's, it's, we will not boot without AGESA, so... Uh, yeah, I'm, I only mean you can initialize the IOMMU with AGESA, right? I'm not, I'm, or I'm not without using, it. I'm not using, like, for IOMMU, um, like, I don't know what AGESA do inside, so I cannot do anything about that. But uh, but all the ACPI creation and the IOMMU driver is outside of Agesa, so I'm doing it in core boot in open source way. So. Thanks. D did you try to reach out to AMD about this problem? And if yes, what was the what was your interaction with AMD on this? Because I think this is a very common problem with the GISA. I think uh, various developers try, try to reach them uh, about that uh, many times and didn't succeed. So I just tried to do the work and not the talks. So, so it's like AMD, like I have relation with AMD. Uh, I, I worked with them in, in different fields. Uh, but uh, I know that it's for them if there is not enough, I don't know, volume or um, not new platform or not something that will make a lot of noise around that, then they probably don't care. Okay. Any more? All right. Thank you very um, much. Thank you very much.